Hi guys, welcome back to In Case of Econ Struggles. Welcome to another macro struggle. Today, we're gonna to start solving the sequential market equilibrium. This is going to be two parts, so two separate videos to solve the sequential market equilibrium. This is part one. What we're gonna to do today, we are going to quickly review the setup of the sequential markets equilibrium world. Then we are going to take first order conditions and get the Euler equation. We're gonna use the Euler equation to get prices and also an idea of how both Bill and Dave's consumption changes over time. Then in part two, we'll go further and we'll use the budget constraints to go ahead and solve for those final allocations. But again, today we're just reviewing, setting up and taking those FOCs to get prices. So let's go ahead and get into it. Timestamps are below if you would like to jump around, but let's just quickly breeze through the sequential market setup that we talked about last time. And remember that in the sequential markets equilibrium, it's very similar to the Arrow de Brew equilibrium, except that now we're allowed to trade every period. So every period, there's a little market for coconuts that pops up. Everyone comes out of their hut. After seeing what their endowment is, you've got people who are willing to lend coconuts. These people are in pink. And you've got people who are willing to borrow coconuts because maybe their endowment this period is pretty low and we're trying to smooth consumption. So those borrowers are in green. And then tomorrow, those borrowers will pay back the coconut to the lender. So here's the market. We also said that Bill's endowment in every period is two zero alternating and Dave's endowment is the opposite. So when Bill gets two coconuts, Dave gets nothing and vice versa. Now we said that the definition of the sequential market competitive equilibrium was the allocation where remember that now Bill and Dave don't only get to choose how much they wanna to consume today. They also choose how many assets they want for the next period or how many coconuts to borrow slash lend. This is really T plus one. And we have prices QT in each period that solves Bill and Dave's utility maximization problem. So here's the utility maximization problem. Now, what I'm gonna do just to make this problem a little more concrete again, is to give both Bill and Dave a actual utility function. We'll call that the natural log of their consumption today. So that will help us again, just to pin down this problem a little bit and make it a little more concrete. And we still have that market clearing condition in the goods market and in the asset market, where we said in each period, the number of coconuts that are borrowed and lended have to be the same. You can't borrow a coconut that doesn't exist and you can't lend a coconut that doesn't exist. We also said that each person can't go into infinite amount of debt. So we said, okay, your AT plus one has to be greater than or equal to some large negative number at all times. And that was called the no Ponzi game condition. Now let's go ahead and take our first order conditions and get rolling here. We know that we are going to take six representative first order conditions. So for Bill, we've got his consumption today, the number of assets he wants tomorrow and his consumption tomorrow and the same for Dave. Let's go ahead and start out with Bill's consumption today. That first order condition is going to look very similar to something we've seen before where it's just going to be beta T and the derivative of his utility function is just one over CTB. And that is going to be equal to lambda t because we have a negative lambda t from the budget constraint. And we know that Bill's consumption tomorrow is going to follow a similar pattern. It's just going to be shifted over one period. So here's his first order condition for his consumption tomorrow. Now let's talk about Bill's first order condition for at plus one because it's gonna be a little different than anything we've seen before. So notice that this period, I have QT AT plus one, and I've still got the lambda. So this is going to be just negative lambda T QT, but we're not done because we need to also think about the budget constraint next period. What is the budget constraint next period? Well, the budget constraint next period is lambda T plus one, okay? E T plus one I plus A T plus one. So notice that A T plus one appears again in the budget constraint next period. So when we're taking this first order condition, we need to keep that other budget constraint in mind. So this is also going to say plus lambda t plus one is equal to zero. This just means that qt is equal to lambda t plus one over lambda t, which is going to be useful in a second, but let's go for Dave's first order conditions as well so we don't leave him out. It's going to be very similar to Bill. So here's beta T one over CTD. That's going to be equal to lambda T. Bill's consumption tomorrow is beta T plus one. 
one over C T plus one D, and that's equal to lambda T plus one. Dave has the same budget constraint as Bill, so that's going to look very similar to that first order condition for AT plus one for Bill. So this is just going to be negative lambda T QT plus lambda T plus one equals zero, which is just going to lead us to the same place. Now let's go ahead and start combining some first order conditions. So this is lambda T plus one. This is lambda T plus one. We also have lambda T here, which is lambda T here. So what we can say is that beta T plus one over C T plus one bill over beta T over C T B is equal to Q T. It's also equal to Dave's first order condition. So we can just write beta T plus one over Dave's consumption all divided by beta to the T over Dave's consumption today. So we know from consumption smoothing and part one of the Air de Brew equilibrium series that we can say that this means that both Bill and Dave will eat the same amount of coconuts forever and ever and ever, which means that we can set this up. We know that CT plus one D over CDT, that's equal to one. So we know that QT is equal to beta, and that is going to be very helpful as we go into the budget constraints. And that is what we are going to solve in part two. So hopefully this gives you a better sense of how to do the first order conditions for the sequential market equilibrium and how to keep track of those budget constraints. If it did, make sure to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time for another case of econ struggles.